everybody. Happy Friday and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host Sinead DeFries and this is The Daily Show where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning first off is senior editor John Campia. Well greetings and salutations everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Headquarters here in Burbank, California and we are so glad you decided to make us a part of your day and I got so much <laughs> Force Friday loot, you have no idea. Let's get a, a wide shot here. This is just some of the stuff from Remote Control BB-8. I got the Millennium Falcon drone. How did I get this stuff? What kind of hours did I need to spend sitting on sidewalks and getting through lines and fighting people? None, because I got an awesome wife who went and did that for me, who's in the... <laughs> She's shaking yeah, her head right now. <laughs> She's shaking her head at me right now. Thank you so much, baby. Aw, cute. <laughs> Also here from Screen Rant, it's David Griffin. Happy Force Friday, everyone. I'm so jealous of all this loot. I can't wait to get my hands on that droid over there. I want to get myself one. It's only $150. That's nothing. $150 is nothing. Oh, I can't wait to take that thing out and start playing with it. Oh, my God. (laughs) And also here is Editor-in-Chief of Collider.com, Steve Weintraub. Uh, thank you for finally having me on the show. I appreciate it. No, I'm kidding. He says, <laughs> like, no, I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. I haven't invited I, him I, before. I've been invited a lot. Uh, just to let you know, this, this we're doing a live Periscope thing as well as... Uh, as this, so if you if you're so, wondering why this phone, yes, is up. he's not so self so obsessed with his social media stream that he's keeping his phone open in front of him during the show. Um, hey, listen, folks, uh, as happens sometimes, a few some a few things came up before our regular schedule stuff that you see in the sidebar here. But before we even get to that, uh, since we got Steve here from the Collider.com side, he's running right now a great contest and giveaway revolving around the upcoming New York Comic Con. Steve, why don't you tell us what you guys are doing over there? We are inviting two lucky people for an all expenses paid uh, trip to a brothel in New York City. Yes. Mm -hmm. But if I was being serious, I would say (laughs) uh, we're giving away actually something amazing. I think that a lot of people want to attend Comic Con and it's really expensive. And so we decided to do a contest where for one winner and a guest, so two people, they will be able to go to Comic Con, have a Two badges for free, airfare, hotel, a four hundred dollar gift card, and we're working on some more surprises for the winners. But basically, is, where is the brothel the surprise? No, it's All actually right. that was me. Yeah, I, I, that would actually be an amazing surprise for two <laughs> people. Uh, but uh, the most the most important thing is for anyone in the continental U.S. Uh, if you win, we're going to fly you for free to do all this. And it's, I mean, it's not a cheap uh, giveaway. So we really want people to enter. Uh, we want to give this away to two people that. You know, two random people are going to win. Uh, but you can enter on Collider. Uh, I don't have the link. Uh, obviously, I don't know what it is off the top of my head. But if you go to Google and type in, like, New York Comic Con Giveaway Collider, it'll obviously pop up number one and uh, enter. And hopefully you'll be the winner. So go on. Keep your eyes open on Collider. Follow Steve on his social media. You'll get his uh, his Twitter and everything a little bit later. Keep your eye open for when that link drops, and make sure you go and make sure you oh, submit yourself. It's it's live now. Oh, it's live now. Yeah, no, you can totally enter right now. Okay, then in that case, head on over to Collider.com and find it and get yourself submitted. Now, before we get to these items we have in the sound bar in the sidebar here, uh, since we got Steve here, he happened a couple days ago to have a chance to sit down with Captain America star Chris Evans. Started talking a little bit about Civil War and things going on but you got into the conversation about you know it's well known after you know infinity one and two chris evans's contract with marvel is up and a lot of people are wondering and asking the question well what happens with him, with him then I, i'm assuming he's just going to want to go but you had a chance to talk to him about that what was chris evans saying about his future with marvel uh he basically i think for people that don't realize uh there was talk like chris basically said that i might be done with acting after my contract's over i might just move on to directing there was a lot of back and forth and a lot of rumors and i mean he wasn't sure i don't think but it's clear that he loves marvel he had an amazing time on civil war and he said as long as marvel wants me i'm theirs Uh, essentially i forget what the exact quote was but it's essentially that and uh which is great to hear because i think he does phenomenal work as captain america i mean i really think he's phenomenal in the role and i think he's getting better and better as an actor and uh so i'm happy that he's enthusiastic and that enthusiasm means that he must have had an amazing time on civil war and the last few films so sinead what's first up 
All right, Jeffrey writes, Greetings, Collider Crew. A story came today talking about Steven Spielberg's upcoming new deal with Universal. In the story, it was suggested that Spielberg wants to reboot both Back to the Future and Jaws. What I want to know is, can this even be possible? Didn't Robert Zemeckis say he wasn't going to allow a Back to the Future reboot as long as he's alive? Thanks for taking my question and bring on the filthy. Where this comes from is a, a report in The Hollywood Reporter that has this big write-up about you know Steven Spielberg wrapping up his his deal at uh, at Disney wants to move the whole you know uh, 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 shingle over to Universal, and then out of nowhere, without explanation, there's this little line in the report. Now remember, this is the Hollywood Reporter. This isn't some rag, and it says, is it? "And Spielberg's interested in rebooting Jaws." <laughs> yeah, did, did, I, Spielberg, did I say that out loud? <laughs> and Spielberg is interested in rebooting Jaws and uh, Back to the Future. By the way, and then they just move on, and it's like, wait, wait, wait a minute! Wait, you just hit us with a truck. What are you talking about? This is interesting for a couple of reasons. One, I can't see Steven Spielberg wanting to reboot Jaws or reboot Back to the Future. Two, as you mentioned in the email, Zemeckis has literally said, pretty much over my dead body in the sense that he has literally said it will have to be after I'm dead and only if my estate is un is unable to keep other people from doing it. So it's an interesting thing. I would really like to know more about how that quote or how that comment in the, the, that report got in there in the first place. What was their reasoning behind putting that in there? Is that something Spielberg has actually said? If not, I have a hard time imagining this can actually happen. David, do you think if Spielberg ends up over at Universal, which looks like it's inevitable now, that we're going to see a Jaws or a Back to the Future reboot under Spielberg? I do, but not for the money. And I, I, I'm sure Zemeckis said what he said, but I feel like if it's a reporter talking to you, you say one thing. If Spielberg calls you up in a professional way and says, hey, let's meet, let's talk, you know, Robert, how can we make this happen? How can I make you happy and how can we make the studio happy and put something together? I think when Steven Spielberg, you know, multi-billionaire, you know, one of the best directors, you know, that's been around for a while, sits down and talks to you one-on-one -on -one about a future franchise, I would think he would at least consider it. So I think it's a possible that it could be done because it's Spielberg coming to him. I'm sure his respectful uh, workers coming to each other and having a discussion about it. I think that could happen, not just because Zemeckis needs more money, but because it's Steven Spielberg asking him personally, if, if that does happen, if that meeting happens. Steve, let me ask you this. No. If, <laughs> it's never happened. But if, if, if no. a director, the caliber of a Steven Spielberg, no. comes to so Zemeckis, hold on, let me finish the question, comes to a Zemeckis nope. and says, Oh, you were saying something. Not only do I want to do a reboot of this, I assure you, I will direct it myself, and I will give it the greatest of care. Do you think it even gives Zem Zemeckis a moment of pause? If to Steven it? Spielberg pulled into Robert Zemeckis' office and said, "I want to direct a Back to the Future reboot," this is so hypothetical, <laughs> completely so, hypothetical, so, so hypothetical. So bridge. <laughs> I think Robert would be like, "I thought we were friends," and then he walks out of the room. I mean, there is never, ever Back to the Future reboot ever going to happen while Zemeckis is alive unless I, I can't even imagine what could cause it to happen and as far as Jaws no that's like Spielberg considers that maybe his best film or one of his best films never going to happen yeah I, I never I want to make sure we all hear this never yeah. like here's the thing circumstances it, we as human beings need to have the prerogative to change our thoughts or opinions on things as new events and new circumstances and new information comes to us look a long time ago i said we on movie talk will never do tv but at the time we were under a movie theater chain and that just made sense but circumstances have changed and whatever and we've re obviously reconsidered that position now and we're really excited about doing tv so is it possible the guy like robert zemeckis is now thinking maybe he just had his third grandchild and he's thinking you know what not only am i set for the rest of my life and my kids are set for the rest of their lives i want to make sure my new granddaughter and her daughters are set for the rest of their lives okay steven cut me that 700 million dollar check and let's make another back to the future but it's not going to happen steven steven david are right it's it's i really don't think it's going to happen but you have to at least keep your eye on the situation for now and see what else comes out of this all right what's next Julian writes, hi, Collider movie crew. My question is concerning Blu-ray extras. Is it just me or are studios putting out less and less Blu-ray extras on their home releases? I have just seen the Blu-ray features for Avengers Age of Ultron, and apart from four deleted scenes in a 20-minute featurette, that's it. This is one of the biggest films of the year, and more and more films are just like this. I remember a time when I had to import my DVDs from the U.S. because the U.K. releases had next to no extras on them either, but it seems this is becoming 
more of the normal everywhere. I am not opposed to studios double dipping sometimes with Ultimate Editions on Blu-ray, but surely there should be more than this on the original releases? I, I have a few things to say about yeah. this. Can I jump in? Please do. First of all, Marvel's coming out with a Phase 2 box set, so I believe that some of the extras that you might have gotten on this Avengers release are going to be in that Phase 2 box. Uh, number two, it goes back to what we were just talking about earlier. Blu-ray sales are not what they were. And more and more people, especially younger people, are content to watch a movie on their iPhone. And they're content to download the movie through a digital copy. And they don't care about owning the physical media. As more and more people move away from owning physical media, the studios have less and less incentive to add and spend the money to make a Blu-ray that much more special. And ultimately, there are very few filmmakers or people, Rob Burnett or... Uh, you know, there's a few people I know who do DVD extras professionally and used to, you know, do these amazing box sets, uh, but they're, they're just not doing it anymore because there's no monetary incentive. Physical media is dying. I mean, it, it just is. It's funny because, you know, John Schnepp and I talk about this all the time as, as he is now fulfilling all of his orders for The Death of Superman Lives. You know, physical media is dying. And it, it, there is an element of this is shame because I don't know if you guys are like me, but I love DVD extras or Blu-ray extras. And everybody knows how much I dislike the prequels. But I own all the prequels. Why? Because they had hours and hours and hours of fascinating stuff uh, about how they made this and how they pulled this off. And it's actually really quite fascinating when you watch it. Lord of the Rings, the various 17 different editions and sets that came out from that. But, you know, they literally had like one disc would have like five hours of extras or whatever fascinating stuff and we had seen over the years them pull back more and more and more to now it's maybe four deleted 30 second scenes and there's even a lot of these blu-rays that come out now that don't have a director's commentary i think steven spielberg will, has never done director's commentary he doesn't ever want to do a director's commentary i believe mm. but it's it's really unfortunate but like steve pointed out where's the incentive for them to do it physical media is dying but you, you know, you can almost look at it the other way and say, since physical media is dying, if you want physical media to try to have a little bit of a longer life, shouldn't you invest more into it, give more value for the buck for people there? I don't really think you do. I think you try to find a way to incorporate that kind of stuff into the streaming platforms now, although that's a difficult thing to do. But David, has the lack or the dwindling amount of special features on DVDs or Blu-rays, has that impacted you in your DVD or, or Blu-ray buying habits or not at all? Before, unless it's a movie I really love, like let's say Mad Max Fury Road. I'm gonna buy that no matter what, no matter what the special features are. Otherwise, I go to a website like Collider, if they do a review, or Blu-ray.com, and I look at the reviews, and they review picture quality, sound quality, and the last thing they review is special features, like you know, out of five stars. And like Steve, uh, Frosty said, very few directors still do that. Ridley Scott may be the best besides Peter Jackson right now in doing that. If you get Prometheus, a 3D, 3D version of it, and it has a regular Blu-ray too, there's a three and a half hour documentary on how to on the making of the film from pre-production to production to post-production. It's worth the price of admission to get the Blu-ray just to watch. Even if you don't like Prometheus, it's still good. Blade that, Runner, same thing. That's, 25th that's anniversary. Charlie uh, Lazarica, yeah. who is D Ridley's DVD guy. And it's he's amazing. the one, he's literally did the Blade Runner box, yeah. the Alien box. He does, uh, pr he did Prometheus. Um, what else? He did Kingdom of Heaven, which is another, mm -hmm. by the way, real quick, if you have not seen the Kingdom of Heaven director's cut. It's a different film. It's completely. it's one of my favorite films of that year. Mm -hmm. And for the love of God, like watch it immediately. So it's yeah, yeah, phenomenal. I, I agree. I, I think that it would give me incentive if these guys do better content because that's what I want to see. I love that. I just watched The Godfather Parts 1 and 2 again and I watched it with Francis Ford Coppola. It's just him each movie, three hours, him just talking by himself about the movie. That's awesome. I love <laughs> doing that. I mean, I, I would do more of that, but they're not doing it anymore. All right, <laughs> what's next? Chris writes, hey guys, love the show. AMC, now Collider Heroes and Jedi Council are my jam. <laughs> I got a question for you about subtitles in movies. Do you think subtitles take away from the enjoyment of movies? I watched Pan's Labyrinth a while back and found the visuals to be absolutely stunning, but I missed so much because I had to read to understand what was going on. Love to hear your thoughts. There are two ignorant points of view on this. Uh, I mean, hey, it's all subjective. Whatever works for you is what works for you. I don't like when people say, oh, I can't stand reading a movie. Then you are missing out on some of the best cinema out there. Life is Beautiful is still what is, is in my top 10 of my all-time favorite things, foreign film. My favorite cop film of all time, still Infernal Affairs. You got to read that. I, I just think you need to get over it a little bit and in, embrace it a bit. But that being said, on the purest side, people say, no, subtitle films are great. You, 
that's great, but you have to acknowledge it does affect the viewing experience at least a little bit because instead of your eyes sometimes being on the face of the character and what they're trying to emote or some of the things going on in the scene or that particular shot that the cinematographer is capturing, some of your attention does have to deviate from those things that a traditional filmmaker would want to be bringing your attention to here and here and here and you have to bring your eyes down to the bottom and read a bit. So you got to get over it a little bit and be willing to embrace subtitle films. But at the same time, if you're a fan of subtitle films, you got to get over this superiority complex of thinking anybody who doesn't watch subtitle films is a swine. No, <laughs> you got to at least acknowledge there is a bit of a drawback to it. It's just that the drawback is worth it to some of us. Anyway, Steve, what do you think? Do you watch a lot of subtitle films? How much yeah. does it affect your viewing experience? I, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think that... Uh, like, I love Pan's Labyrinth, but of course it does take away from the film when you have to read the subtitles just because you're distracted. It's like when someone's talking in a movie theater near you, it wakes you up from the dream. When you have to, like, focus on something else but the screen itself and you have to read, it, it takes away a little bit. Saying that, some of the best movies out there are subtitled. And I think that if you love a movie that much, like a Pan's Labyrinth or whatever other movie you want to mention, you watch it the first time and you watch it with subtitles. Then if you love it, you watch it again and maybe don't read the subtitles as much, but enjoy the visuals. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that you have to acknowledge it does pull you a little bit away, but it's so worth it. No, I agree. It's, it, it's worth it. Um, I know we're on Clarity now as we talk a little TV. There's a new show called Narcos out on Netflix right now about the life of Pablo Escobar. And I don't think that show could have been made on ABC or Fox, not just because of the language or the violence, but because it's there's so much Spanish. And it's not, you know, fully Spanish, but, you know, there's, there's uh, also English as well, but there's so much Spanish. And I want the authenticity. When I, when I watch, like, not to criticize some of the CW shows, like, on The Flash and somebody's having a, a, a conversation in Spanish, all of a sudden they'll break halfway in the middle of the conversation and start speaking in English. I have a friend, uh, Michael Medina, who uh, he's he's going to be on the Club of the Cloud, you know, Cloud After shows, and he's... Uh, Hispanic himself, and when he's having a serious conversation with one of his friends in Spanish, he doesn't break midway in conversation and start speaking English. It's not realistic. So I want to see that full conversation in Spanish. Daredevil did full conversations in Spanish. I think it's authentic, and we should respect and Russian that. And, and Russian and everything. Yeah. They didn't like break and be like, "Oh wait, now we're talking English now." You know, just to like show like, "Hey, we're diverse, but we're not that diverse." <laughs> it's like if you're going to go all the way, go all the way. The, the best thing I've said this again and again, and I've brought it up with filmmakers. The best use of. Uh, Another language, and then going into English. I know exactly. I was going to say the same thing. I know it's, exactly what you're going to say. It's time for Red October. Yes, when yeah. they're reading the Bible passage, and, and like, all of a no, sudden, all, this camera zooms in on someone's mm -hmm. mouth, and they're talking Russian, and all of a sudden, boom! From Russian, it goes to English. You pull back, and you realize everyone's talking in Russian, but you get to hear it in English right. because yes. you're yeah. in the room. I'm so it's glad you brought, that's yeah. exactly what I was going to say. Mm -hmm. The hunt for Red October. Amazing. Is people should people should steal that. technique. They should use it again Absolutely. and again. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. What's next? Jessica writes, hi guys, love the show and watch it every day after work. Keep it up. I know you guys said you mostly enjoyed Zac Efron's Neighbors and that you were looking forward to the sequel. So I was wondering what you guys thought about the announcement that Selena Gomez was going to be joining the cast. And do you know if the title is actually going to be Neighbors 2 Sorority Uprising? Not sure if I love or hate that title. David, what about you? Do you what what do you, would you think about Selena Gomez joining Neighbors 2? And then what would you think if theoretically... <laughs> Neighbors 2 Sorority Uprising is the title. I am very excited about the title. Uh, a little hesitant, you know, I, I've said this before on uh, Movie Talk, I'm always a little worried about comedic sequels. I think The Hangover, but I know there's also some very good sequels as well out there. Selena Gomez, she's, you know, she's a darling. I mean, she's, you know, everybody seems to love her. You know, she's cute. She doesn't, I, I don't do anything for me. It's not going to bring me in. I'm not, not going to go see a movie because Selena Gomez is in it, but because Selena Gomez is in a neighbor sequel, of course I'm going to go see it because I love the first Neighbors film. That's why. Not Not because of Selena Gomez, but I'm sure she won't. Heard it if she's in it. Steve? I think that the best thing that could happen with Neighbors 2, uh, which, by the way, I'm down with Selena Gomez being in it. It's natural. It's her age. She's going to be in a sorority. I think I can believe she would be in a sorority. <laughs> um, I think the best thing they could do, though, is cast everyone from Spring Breakers. Or, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, and yeah. make all the girls yeah. from that in the sorority. So it's like an like if you've seen... Is it Spring Breakers? Spring Breakers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Get Vanessa uh, Hutchins back in oh, there. Oh, all of them. <laughs> if they were all in the movie as sorority sisters, or at least like a nod, like an Easter egg, I think it'd be great. I, I feel a little bit torn by this because on the one hand, well, first of all, I love the title. I think it's a great title. If you know the tone of Neighbors and the kind of the ridiculousness of it, Sorority Uprising sounds like a great title. With Selena Gomez, I 
look, Spring Breakers was a little bit of a polarizing film because some people really love that film. Mm -hmm. Like really, they see something very artistic in it and they just love it. I was on the other side of the fence. I, I was not all that thrilled with Spring Breakers and I wasn't all that thrilled with Selena Gomez being in it as well. That being said, when you're talking about the sorority, look how many um, frat guys were in the house in the first neighbors that didn't have major roles. Yeah. Like whether it's McLovin or a bunch of the other guys that were in there, they had small roles that they could fit in well and, and do the things that they do. And it worked great. Selena Gomez, if she's not like the lead female, and we already know that the lead girl in it Chloe is Moritz. Uh, Chloe Grace. Mm -hmm. Chloe Moretz, that, that she's going to be great in it. So maybe she will fit in well in one of those, uh, you know, more laid back, a little bit more in the background kind of scenarios. Um, but I'm also be totally down with making it a Spring Breakers pseudo uh, sequel. I think that would be the whole cast. It would be would an interesting that. wink. We were talking about how like these guys might, uh, uh, Seth Rogen and Zach Efron might have to team up. You know, like they might. Oh, no, have to I, I think it's oh, what I think they did. Yeah, 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 yeah team up. And, yeah, yeah. That, that's going to be fun to see that. It's going to be fun. All right, what's next? Michael writes, greetings from Ireland. My question to you guys is, do you think that Marvel would have done a different story for Cap 3 and that Civil War is sort of a retaliation towards DC and Batman v Superman? I can't help but think that if DC hadn't have planned to do um, BVS, that Marvel wouldn't have done Civil War. Thanks for your insight and keep up the great work. No. <laughs> no. For, for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, I'd be dying to know what you guys think about this. But on the one hand... Kevin Feige, like we hear things announced and a lot of people just make the natural assumption Kevin Feige decided this yesterday and is announcing it today. No, Kevin Feige decided this three years ago <laughs> and is now ready to announce it. Um, so this is all stuff that's planned way, way ahead. Now, there are exceptions, there are absolutely exceptions. But you know, when you talk to Kevin Feige and we had him in studio the one time and he was talking about how this, this at the time he didn't tell us it was uh, Captain America Civil War, but he did tell us, look, my plan for the next Captain America movie is something I have been aiming towards for three years. So that, that's that been on the docket. Also, though, the notion that this is not a basketball game between DC and Marvel. You don't play offense and defense. It's not like Marvel gains anything if fewer people go to see a DC movie. It's, there's, there's not a tit-for-tat going on at all. Look, Marvel right now could have put out Iron Man 4 Tony Stark poops. They could have done that. And that film's going to make $300 million domestic. So they know that. So no, it, it had nothing to do, the Batman v Superman thing had nothing to do with Civil War. And conversely, Batman v Superman being made had nothing to do with them catching wind that Marvel was going to do Civil War either. It, one has nothing to do with the other, at least the way I see it. Steve, do you see it any other way? You're 100% right. That's it. <laughs> you're, yeah, I agree 100 right. I don't. I mean, DC is Marvel's going to chart their own course. He's going to chart their own course. They're not going to try to mimic what DC is doing. Marvel's not going to go dark all of us like dark, like you know, DC dark, like in the rain and you know the mood and all that. I mean, they're going to stick to what they do best because they make hundreds of million dollars, you know, every year. So why would they change their, their game plan now because of what DC is doing? Exactly. All right. What's next? Kyle writes, Hey Collider, I watch the show daily and I love the new green. I am younger, having been born in the late 90s, and I noticed growing up that everybody, including myself, loved Pirates of the Caribbean. In fact, I hadn't heard of anybody disliking it until I watched your show and others like it. So I was wondering, why is there such a big gap in critic and audience response to this franchise? Thanks, and keep up the awesome work. Steve, what do you think? Well, I think we can use the Alice in Wonderland effect. It's like the worst movie I've ever seen to make a billion dollars. I mean, mm -hmm. it's shameful, awful. The first Pirates of the Caribbean, great. I loved and, it. Yeah, yeah. Everyone, yeah. everyone thinks it's great. You're not wrong if you loved the first Pirates of the Caribbean. The second and third movie are have interesting set pieces, but they don't have the magic of the first film. And I think that, what, there have been four now? Yeah. Yeah, the fourth mm -hmm. one, I, I mean, I don't even remember, like, the story of the second, third, and fourth, and I don't even think it matters. There was a mermaid and a yeah, Budweiser. Yeah. Yeah. Davy Jones. Or, yeah. No, that was the, the one before. That was, like, oh, a third that was or something. Third, yeah. Yeah. That's, how confusing, yeah. <laughs> that's how forgettable <laughs> the fourth one is. I think that, uh, that the first one has a lot of magic, and it's yeah. a special film, like a special film, and I think it's because of that that people keep on going. And ultimately, it's these huge spectacle movies in another time and a place. Um, but there's a re for me, I have no, I, I'm not like, oh my God, I can't wait for another Pirates of the Caribbean movie. I would almost at this point need to be told this one's actually good, you right. know, before I can be like, oh, I want to go see that. Yeah, I mean, as far as the one part of your question goes, well, why is there such a wide gap between the critics thinks of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies and what the audience said? There's not, actually. Like, we can sometimes get caught up in this notion that if me and my circle of friends and the people who are immediately around me think one thing, 
It's natural for us as human beings. We adopt this idea that this is then what the world thinks. This is what the majority of people think around me. And that's often not the case. Now, when you're talking about the difference between a critic rating of a movie and an audience rating of a movie, keep this in mind. A critic generally goes and sees every film, whether it's a film that would appeal to them or not, and they go see every film, and hopefully if they're a decent critic, they try to sit back objectively and go, okay, well, this is what I honestly thought about it. For audience members, that's generally people who were already predisposed to wanting to see that movie, obviously because they went and they bought a ticket and they went to go see it. And so they were predisposed. People want to go see Johnny Depp playing Captain Jack again. They're a little bit predisposed. But even then, if you actually look at the critic ratings and the fan ratings of number two and three, they're not all that far apart. There's really only about 18 to 20% around that neighborhood. Differences between the critic ratings and the fan ratings. And then in the fourth one, it's like a 52% uh, audience rating too. So it mm -hmm. also is that. So really, the idea that the critic rating of, of Pirates and the audience rating of Pirates are really big, far apart, they're actually not. David, how do you yeah, see it? Yeah, I see the same way. The same depends on the film. Like right now, this movie, uh, The War Room, uh, if you go on Rotten Tomatoes, not doing very well critic wise, but fan wise, it's like almost in the 90s percent, you know, approval because it's a movie about faith and the people that are going to see that. Like I know some people that are uh, in church that have like you know gone like take church buses to go see the movie. They are their minds are made up. They're going to see this film. This film is for them, and they're going it's to enjoy it. At them, yeah. exactly. They're going to enjoy it. So I mean, parts of the Caribbean. If you're a fan of it, just because the critics don't like it, again, don't feel bad about that. I mean, enjoy it because you enjoy it. Even if we don't like it, let's say the second, third, or or fourth one of the new one coming out, enjoy it. I mean, it's always it's hard though because like you see critics come out, they say this, this, and this. We do, you know, it's part of what we do. And I, I've been there before. I've, I've liked movies that people no one else liked, but it's okay. Just like it, enjoy it. <laughs> it's a freedom called, to see what you want. It's called Starship Troopers. It's called Tremors. I can yeah, give you a list yeah. of I love Tremors. Yeah, those yeah are well, great. These movies, like, you know, I love them, but some people do not. Right. So right. I mean, if you love something, that's it. Yeah. All right, what's next? Timothy writes, what's up, Collider? I've been watching for years since the AMC days and can't miss an episode. My question is regarding the visual effects and the directors. I hear you guys always say that Zack Snyder is a great visual director, and I agree 100%. But isn't that mostly on the effects supervisor and his or her team? I know the director has input and say into what the visuals ultimately look like, but how much exactly? Thanks, and keep it coming. P.S. Damn it, Dennis. <laughs> damn it, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, here's the thing. You got to remember, too, about that fine line between the visual effects coordinator and the director of the film. Yeah, the visual effects, like a John Knoll, for example, the guy who created Photoshop, one of the, one of the top guys over at uh, um, uh, ILM. He's done a lot of visual effects work in his time, and he's even dabbled in directing a little bit. But at the end of the day, it's the visual effects supervisor's job to bring the director's vision to life. Now, some directors will give their visual effects coordinators a little bit more leeway to be creative and come up with stuff if they really trust their guy and it's back and forth. But ultimately, you know, when you get a guy like Zack Snyder, he's the guy who comes up for the vision. Like, this is what I want to see, and this is how I want to see it. And then it's the visual effects guys who then take that blueprint and say, okay, now let's make it happen and make it there. So it's definitely a give and take relationship. It's a, it's a really big balance. David, how do you see it? Uh, I th coming back to the prequels and talking about a little bit uh, Blu-ray extras. And I was watching the prequel, the Star Wars Blu-ray extras. When Lucas, whenever he would come into a room, whether it was the storyboards or the visual effects room, everybody would kind of like stop. And they, granted, it's Lucas, but you, they would look at him and see. He would look at everything, analyze it. And then kind of pick apart. He didn't seem to be doing it in a inappropriate way. It was just like, okay, maybe a little bit of this here, a little less here, and people would stop and listen. So again, like you said, it's the it's their job to see the director's vision through. Lucas might not be at the computer himself doing things, but he's overseeing everything. I don't know how Snyder operates necessarily, but I know that Lucas definitely has a hand in, in his visual effects. If sure. you watch those extras though, and I'm sure you have at some point. It is insane. Mm -hmm. What like if I'm trying to think if I was a visual effects guy in that room and George Lucas comes in and goes, yeah, so we couldn't, um, I really want this one actor in this scene. And we didn't shoot the scene with him, but uh, put him in it right. and make it look like he's walking down the stairs with him. And you're like, what? What are you talking about? What? They did, and then they did that they with find... Dooku's face uh, in the, some of the fight scenes. With yeah. Christopher Lee. They had to like digital, you know, put in his face because he was too old to do all that, you know, sword play. Well, the big one for me, though, <laughs> is when the, the new queen, right? Mm -hmm. Or no, it might have been the first one, too. Anyway, in on Naboo, the queen, and she's got a bunch of her court people, they're walking down the halls of the palace and they start to walk down the stairs. And there's the guy, like her advisor, from the first film, the old guy with the big white yeah. beard, he wasn't there. He wasn't. They didn't shoot the scene with him, and he's like, yeah, "I think he should be in the scene." So they shot him from England. Make it look like they put some boxes together. Make it look like he's walking down mm -hmm. some stairs, and he's take him now digitally composited him, so it looks like he's in the scene. And everything's like, 
Uh, crazy. I mean, those, those, those movies really uh, pushed the boundaries of what's natural today or what people can they do. They really with, did. Uh, but uh, regarding the visual effects, some directors like a Bay, Michael Bay, George Lucas, um, Steven Spielberg, they're going to be very specific with what they want to see in the shot. Other directors who are like a little more green might have more... Uh, uh, back and forth with the visual effects supervisor in terms of how should the shot look. Right. And I think that it's important just like in life, you know, it all depends on the person. And some directors really want that help. And some directors know I want the robot moving exactly like this. The mm. shot is too dark. We need to brighten it, you know, like a Michael Bay. Mm. Mm. All right, folks. Well, listen, it is Friday, which means it's time for that uh, futile exercise that we do and trying to predict with the top five. I mean, the first couple of weeks we did our box office predictions, by the way, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. I was nailing it. I was crushing it, but I am over. Like in the last three <laughs> weeks, I have whiffed every single one. So what? here's what we're going to do. The three of us here at the table, we are going to try to come up and try to guess what come Monday morning are going to be the top five in order, the top five films at the box office on Monday. Uh, I'm going to botch this completely, so I might as well lead this thing off. Coming in number one will be the Transporter Refueled. I believe it has enough of a buzz going right now that it can get $10 million at the box office, and I believe $10 million at the box office is going to be enough to make it the number one film. I think number two is going to be The Visit. Um, look. Wait, 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 did The Visit come out this weekend? Uh, I think it's, is it not coming out this, wait, wait is it? Oh no, it's not coming out this weekend. You just had me I looked scared. It up. Oh my goodness, okay. Where's your review? Yeah. <laughs> Where's like, your review? We gotta write your review. Some interviews, and I'm like, oh my God, I screwed this up bad. <laughs> oh my goodness, I thought, thank you for correcting me. Okay, so then it's, it's still staying at number one is going to be The Transporter. At number two then, I'm gonna go for Straight Outta Compton. I think it's gonna be number two. I think War Room, which none of us saw coming, I think it's gonna hold strong at number three. I think at number four is gonna be Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, and coming in number five if it is opening this weekend as i think it is the perfect guy is opening this weekend yes i don't know i don't I, i'll be honest with you i don't think so i can look it up for you yeah look up but i'm gonna say the per and if not the perfect guy then i'm gonna take a really big stab in the dark here and guess that but the I man be, from uncle oh. will jump up into number five i could be wrong though september uh, 11th okay so then i'm gonna go man from uncle is gonna jump up into the number five spot anyway steve what about you i'm gonna tell you right now i have absolutely no idea what's gonna win this box office weekend i am almost i'm gonna the only thing i'm gonna be sure of is transporter will not be number one hmm. i'm gonna say that compton some, finds a way to be so what do we got we got compton i'm gonna say that's number one i have absolutely no idea i'm terrible at this uh compton what was number two last weekend uh, War Room? War Room, War Room yeah. was number two. And, and last weekend, Mission Impossible. Mm -hmm. You know, it's actually shocking that another big release is not coming out this weekend. I know. It's crazy. This, this would because, have been a ripe weekend to drop a big film. Because it doesn't make sense that August was so crowded, and this weekend, there's nothing but Transporter. Yeah. So it does feel a little bit like, what? And especially because football doesn't start for another week. I know. So yeah. this is a and for guys like us, that's a big deal. Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, if... Free anyway. Brady, by the way. No, no, keep him in <laughs> right. Keep him in jail. Let's, let's not <laughs> jail. No <laughs> Buffalo. I'm, I'm going to say, though, that, that it's going to be like last weekend where Compton, uh, War, War Room, Room, Mission Impossible. I'm going to say it's the exact as last weekend. Uh, no, no. Uh, Compton, Transporter, War, War Room, Mission Impossible. I'm doing top. David, four. what about you? Yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm with Stevie. I, I think Compton. I think. I think Compton Transporter War Room, and Mission Impossible, and the Man from Uncle. Okay, so now Compton, I think, made 11 million last weekend. I think so, this was close. War Room was close too. Yeah, almost 11, like, like close. almost 11 million yeah. as well. So you got to assume it's probably going to drop to about seven, right. maybe seven, eight. It's probably going to take a, at least a 30 or 40 percent drop. Yeah, problem. So we're saying so you guys are thinking Transporter does not crack eight or nine million this weekend. I'm going to say it's between 8 and 10 million for Transporter, but that, again, I'm terrible at box office. So apparently, so am I. I thought I was good <laughs> at it, but apparently I'm terrible at it. I just don't think it's going to be a good weekend at the box office because there's nothing that's saying to people, you have to come to the movies right. this weekend. The Transporter, as much as I want to support the film, is not a, oh my God, I have to go see this. You keep forgetting it's Labor Day weekend, yeah, the holiday weekend. You think they would have put something you, out. This would have been a great but opportunity. The, but the other thing is a lot of people like to travel and yeah. you know maybe they're avoiding. But anyway, the point is I think this is going to be a weak weekend at the box office and it's going to get a lot better in September, especially uh, with all the movies coming out. Right. Like, mm -hmm. And I, by the way, I heard The Visit's really good. I'm hearing good things about The Visit. Like I'm hoping. I no, want to no, cheer for M. Night. M. Night's return to form. That's what everyone is telling me He's who's back. seen it. Yes. 
All right. Everyone. All right, folks. Well, that'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films are playing over at our friends at AMC Theaters. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and, of course, your movie ticket information. On Facebook, make sure you find Collider on Facebook and make sure you follow it. Give it a like and make sure you become a follower of Collider on Facebook over there. Hey, don't forget, we also got an Instagram account. Find us on Instagram at Collider Video and find us everywhere you're going to find things on social media. I want to thank the guy sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting on my left, Mr. David Griffin. David, where can people find you online? You can find me at Twitter, uh, at GriffinDE. You can find uh, some of my writings, uh, TV reviews. I'm going to be reviewing Star Wars Rebels for ScreenRant.com this fall. Uh, also, Think Hero Pro, you can find me. And it's Force Friday, so go pick up your uh, Poe Dameron Funko. Yes, <laughs> just don't touch mine. Oh, sorry. All right, and of course, sitting over here, Mr. <laughs> Steve Weintraub. Steve, where can people find you? And remind us again about this contest. Uh, well, first of all, you can find me on Collider and on Twitter as Collider Frosty. Uh, and the contest, as we said earlier, New York Comic Con, two free tickets to, uh, to attend, free airfare, free hotel, $400 gift card, plus a few surprises that we're still working on. But basically, if you want to go to Comic Con, you live in the continental United States, and you want to go for free, this is the way to go. I mean, you literally will not spend any money. <laughs> and of course, our lovely host today, Ms. Sinead DeFree. Sinead, where can people find you? I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Sinead DeFries and at that's so Sinead.com. And of course, you can follow me on the various social media outlets on Twitter and on Facebook, just at John Campia. And uh, hey guys, listen, I uh, I just launched the Kickstarter actually for my new novel, The Pride. Uh, if you want more information, find me on Facebook, find me on Twitter, or just go to Kickstarter and search for The Pride and uh, see what's going on with that. Thanks a lot for joining us, guys. My name is John Campia for Collider Video. And until next time, bye bye.